there, I'm Joni Simon, food photographer. Welcome to my studio. This is The Bite Shot, where I share the things that I've learned on my food photography journey in hopes that it helps you on yours. And today we are digging into my process for making DIY backdrops, homemade, do-it-yourself backdrops. Now, I shared a video about this process back in 2018, but understandably, I have learned a couple things in that period of time, made a lot of backdrops, so I wanted to share an updated process with you. Now, I do also have videos on this channel about making wood backdrops, as well as reviews of backdrops I've purchased. So all of that information, as well as a step-by-step -step guide to this entire process are all linked down below and over at thebiteshot.com. But now before I get out any of the materials or start making the backdrop, I start with some good quality inspiration. What I've started doing is just collecting images or different things that I come across that I'm like, ooh, that would make such a great backdrop. You can see my Pinterest board linked down below, but I collect images from the internet, cookbooks, magazines, even like when I'm just out in the world and I see a texture I really like, like we were out at the Arboretum recently and I saw this tree with this bark that I thought, oh, that would make such a cool backdrop. So I took a picture, saved it to my board. But I also look beyond food images. Like I love different materials, different fabrics. Like I really love suede. That's been sort of a quality that I've been trying to apply to a lot of the recent backdrops I've been creating. I really like bold colors. Now, of course, your personal preferences for your eye and your taste and what you like in backdrops may be completely different than what's on mine. So I definitely recommend you start your own board because there's not a right or wrong. It's just a matter of the vision that you're trying to create and the boards that provide you the background, the backbone of your image to bring that vision to life. Now the inspiration for today's board, this vibrant avocado green board that we've created came from an image I came across in the Shaquille O'Neal cookbook. The photographer Eva Kalenko is somebody who I really enjoy following her work. She's based out of San Francisco. You can check out more info about her down below. And my friend Brendan, who's a food stylist who I work with often, we were gonna do this kebab shoot and I thought it was like the perfect combination, bold colors, freshness. So that is the inspiration that I took with me into creating this backdrop. So now let's talk about the materials and the tools for creating the backdrops. So of course you need your wood, right? I mean, you can create a backdrop on canvas, on all, I mean, all sorts of materials I've seen people use for backgrounds. For me personally, I do like a rigid surface, typically based out of wood. The thing that we used in the 2018 version of this video was laminated plywood, which I have tons of backdrops made from that material. I have I have moved towards this half inch thick MDF board, which is just a bit more substantial in comparison to the laminated plywood. I also really like, one of the things that I really pay attention to in the boards that I buy is that I like the actual texture of the board itself, that it's pretty minimal, it's pretty smooth without being slick. But for example, there's different particle boards out there that I personally don't like to use as much because they do have a bit too much texture going on and it is hard hard to kind of cover that up with the other materials that we're gonna use in this process, but maybe that's the look you're going for, which is great. But I do think it's important to pay attention to the existing texture of the board or the wood or whatever it is that you're using to create your backdrop. Now the question comes up, what is the optimal size for a backdrop for food photography? And for my personal preference, my minimum size is two feet by three feet. I really don't like anything smaller than that. I have made some smaller backdrops, but they just don't get used as often because I do find them limiting, especially if I'm doing a flat lay and I wanna kinda of go a wider perspective on it, or I need to kinda of have a backdrop behind the scene that's propped up. I need enough size enough width and height in order to cover that area. So I find two feet by three feet generally does provide that. However, these MDF boards, I really like that they're a little extra long. I think they are two feet by four feet. I like that little extra bit of length because then instead of having to kind of jerry-rig some way to prop it up against for the backdrop part of the scene, obviously it's easy enough to lay them flat on a surface for flat lays and for the surface, but to get that background, it's nice when you could just like prop it right up against the table. And that's kind of my typical go-to move. Now for the shorter boards, in order to get them 
into that position. I will stack them on Apple boxes or stack them up on something else that you have available. But I would say if you do that, make sure you have some sort of way to secure those because there have been plenty of examples I've seen from folks who have reported in who have set it up that way and then suddenly something gets jostled after they've set the food up and the board falls on the food. You don't want that happening. So just make sure everything is nice and secure. But most of the boards that are in my collection are somewhere between two feet by three feet to four feet by five feet. I do think I have a five foot board. Although you just do wanna make sure that whatever you're doing, that it's not so physically cumbersome to swap it in and out of the scene. Especially if you are doing long shoot days or swapping backdrops off, it can get really annoying and difficult to deal with if they are too heavy. Anybody who has ever gone down the road of wanting to get a real marble slab for their food photography knows that that's just like, it's so frustrating because you're like, I why am I gonna shoot this? I can't even lift it. Now, as far as adding texture to the board, the other material you need is joint compound. That's what I use to add the texture. I just go into my local hardware store, Home Depot, look for the joint compound. It's usually in the section around the drywall. Some people will call this putty or spackle. I mean, I'm sure there's different names for it. If you have a different name for it, I think especially countries outside the US may call this something different. So if they call it something different, let us know down in the comments below. But we refer to it here locally as joint compound. And then you get a joint knife or a putty knife, some sort of spackle knife, something that allows us to apply that to the board. Now, in terms of a container this size, this is like the little small guy. We do have bigger tubs that Mr. Simons used for drywall projects, things like that. But a little tub like this is kind of great because I can usually get four to six surfaces worth out of this, depending on how thick you apply that joint compound. And then for adding the color to the board, you're gonna want paint. Now I've used lots of different kinds of paint, experimented with a lot of different things. You can absolutely use spray paints. You can use craft paints, interior paints. Lots of folks out there say it's great to go get samples of paints if you don't wanna to commit to an entire can or jar or whatever. To me, what I really like is a matte paint, something that is not gonna have sheen or shine to it. But certainly if the sheen, the shine, the high gloss aligns with the creative vision you have, then that's great. There's nothing saying these have to be done in matte paint. I just find that matte paint gives me a surface that's perhaps sometimes easier to work with and fits the aesthetic that I'm trying to achieve. My personal favorite when it comes to the paints are these chalk paints that I find at the craft store. So Michaels, Joann's, Amazon. I'll link all the brands that I'm using in the blog post down below. But there's also a suede one that just has this really great velvety quality to it that I've used in this red backdrop. So anything that's going to impart that kind of nice matte texture is what I'm going for. But now I do recommend, even if you are planning to do sort of one solitary color, that if you are looking for a bit of kind of organic feel to that backdrop, a little bit of visual variety, is getting several different shades of that color in addition to a white and a black, maybe even a gray, maybe even a complementary color that we can kind of mix in. You'll see in the process as I apply the paints how those different colors can just really add a lot of dimension to the final board. And then for applying the paint, we have brushes. I really like to use sponges for some interesting texture. I also like to use, we will call these in the art world, found objects, but really all that relates to is trash. <laughs> so this is a recycling project. But by taking things like plastic bags, bubble wrap, different things with different textures, even paper towels can impart interesting textures and patterns onto your surface. And then I always have a water bucket handy if I need to water things down, rinse brushes, all that good stuff. But now let's go ahead and jump into the actual process. So step number one, you get a big old scoop of that joint compound and you slap it down on the board and you start to move it around and just cover the entire board in that that joint compound. Now, the way that I've kind of refined this process over time, I used to have a bit of a heavier hand in terms of applying that texture. I've found over time that I personally prefer 
a bit more of a subtle texture as opposed to a really like intense texture. Again, this is gonna be personal preference and you're gonna explore this through making more backdrops. I mean, obviously the first one, it's like making your first pancake. You're like, oh, I learned a lot doing that. But I have progressively gotten a bit more subtle in terms of that texture. So I get a really nice thin, even layer across the entire surface. And I do try to keep that thin, but still thick enough that it is covered the board that I don't see any of that wood color coming through that I have that completely gray white across the entirety of the board. Another important thing that I always keep in mind as I'm especially creating that sort of initial layer and as I continue to add texture and build up the layers here on the surface is I do still want to make sure that it's flat because if there's too much irregularity or wonkiness or unevenness to the surface for things like soups or drinks or just bowls in general that they may not lay flat on the surface so things might end up a little wonky once you actually start placing things on the surface. So always keep that in mind. But as I'm adding this joint compound and I take the same philosophy into the painting process is that I'm building up and I'm taking away and I'm building up and I'm taking away. So it's sort of like this chipping away process to kind of reveal an interesting, unexpected texture. I mean, there's only so much of this that you can plan. A lot of it sort of evolves organically. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. Are you like, oh, I did that, but I don't like that. Then you can scrape it away and add some more. But one of the really fun things that happens in this joint compound stage is after you've kind of got that initial layer down and you've smoothed it down and then you start to come back and add some more and then you pull it away, add some more, pull it away, is that once different areas of it start to dry and you get some of that dried on the actual joint compound knife is that if you start to drag it, then you see these kind of little bubbles and these little aberrations and imperfections start to kind of pop up. And I just, I look at those and I go, oh, it's so cool, right? Like that's great texture for us to work with. You can even, once you've kind of gotten everything down, like smooth off, clean off the knife and just like lightly drag it, like ever so slightly, just pull it across the surface of the board and you'll see these little interesting textures start to emerge. I also like to play with things like crosshatch patterns. If you've ever taken a painting class, a lot of these techniques will apply there as well. The idea of I kind of crisscross in different areas and allow little dings and dents and little imperfections to fall into the surface. And then of course, taking our trash, our found objects, kind of smashing those into the surface. I love to take a towel and just kind of press that in or take that bubble wrap. You can even like, I recommend working with gloves unless you wanna, you know, ruin your manicure or, or like super dry out your skin because joint compound is very drying. But if you've got gloves on and they're smooth gloves, just kind of like running those over the surface. See what happens, experiment. I mean, worse comes to worse, like I said, scrape it away, add a new layer and keep working at it. But once I have got the whole board covered and I've achieved that look on the surface that is pleasing to my eye and maybe is aligned with the inspiration that I'm working from, then important step, we wanna make sure to let it dry. And I let it dry for at least 24 hours. I know probably at this point you're like, Ooh, I can't wait to apply the paint. I'm ready to get going. But really you want to make sure that it fully dries before we start to add the paint. Because if you just start to put paint on top of the wet spackle, you're going to lose all of that texture that you worked so hard to create. Now, one thing to keep in mind is there are plenty of folks out there who make these DIY backdrops and think, oh, this is such a fun process. Like I want to do this all the time. Like it really feeds your creative soul. Whereas there are plenty of other folks who try this for the first time and are like, oh, this is like, I feel like a fish out of water. This is not my bag. This is not my cup of tea. Oh, this is way too time intensive. Then there are definitely great surfaces out there that you can purchase from people. You could absolutely do that. So no matter which camp you fall into, there's lots of great surface options for you. But for me, I just totally zen out in the process and honestly, just sometimes make backdrops for the fun of it. So once that joint compound has dried and you're ready to apply your paint, I use kind of a very similar method as I did with the joint compound. So I start out by kind of covering the whole surface in a color, sort of like a base color. So I start off with kind of like this basic base layer, which may or may not be similar to like my ultimate color. You can see this is kind of more of a pale muted green, but to me it's kind of a good anchor underneath color because it's all about layering it up just like 
like we layered the joint compound, like we got kind of that singular layer down, and then we added texture, we took it away. We added texture, we took it away. We're doing the same exact thing with the paint, that we're getting this base layer down, but then I'm gonna start to squirt some different colors onto the scene. And I'm not necessarily using a painter's palette at this point, I'm just like squirting it straight on and moving it around, smushing it around, using things like my brushes or sponges. I love to get like a damp sponge because it really helps the paint to kind of move around, especially to these things like the chalk paint, which have a lot of like chalky pigment in them. When you add water to that, it kind of helps them move around. And as I've studied different backdrops, like there's this kind of watercolor kind of quality that I personally really enjoy. And so I'm getting sort of that similar effect by putting down paint, adding water to it, kind of letting it run around, allowing for the opportunity of these happy accidents that you can't really like fully plan it out. But we can see how we can add these different colors too. Of course, the different tones of green, but then adding, you know, just to kind of cool things down a little bit if it feels like things are a little too warm by adding some blue to the equation. Or if you need to warm it up, for example, adding some yellows or adding some oranges. Now it really does help and you will have a distinct advantage if you have taken any painting classes or things like that, but you can absolutely use painting techniques. One thing you can do that definitely has helped me is that here on YouTube, there are a ton of painting channels. Like just watch some different painting videos. You can get some really great ideas there. For example, one technique that I came across in a painting video at some point to, you know, apply different colors onto your, like onto a paper plate or whatever you're using as a palette. And then you dip your brush in it to have multiple colors on the brush and then start to run that brush around. And you'll see that like both of those individual colors come out, but then they also combine in areas, again, creating sort of that interesting dynamic feel. But also for a good measure of like therapeutic painting, love me some Jackson Pollock approach for kind of like that splatter paint. You know, just adding a little bit of water again to the paint can create a bit of extra viscosity to it, that then we can splatter that around and then let it dry. Like let those actual splatters dry, kind of wipe them away, see how it kind of reveals what's underneath. You're gonna discover a lot in this process of adding and taking taking away, adding and taking away. I also love using sponges. I just get a damp sponge, so like a kitchen sponge. You just get it nice and wet and then wring it out. So it's not like, well, you could use a soaking wet and see how that goes too. That could totally work. But just a nice damp sponge and then get that in some of the color. And you can just like directly press the sponge in to get kind of that same sort of like the little holes in the pockets, that texture so that it's almost like a stamp going onto the surface. That can be a fun technique or like, you know, kind of dropping it in like that. But also too, just using that is like something to smooth around. Again, a good reason to have gloves on in this process, but just kind of smoothing that around as well. Experimentation is definitely the name of the game because by being able to do these different techniques and then feel and see what that reveals, it's really fun and surprising. I also love to use the dry brush technique, a technique from the painting world where you've got a brush and you've painted, it's not like fully loaded with the paint anymore. It's just kind of got some still hanging on on the bristles is that it's a mostly dry brush and just dragging that over the surface and you get kind of that streaky effect going on. One other tool that can be super helpful to have around in this process, particularly if you're working with brushes or you have hair or you have pets around with pet hair, is that sometimes little hairs will get stuck in the paint, is just have some tweezers so you can just pull those out much easier than trying to get them with your fingers, where then you're like messing up your paint and messing up your texture and you're like, ah, I gotta paint over that. Now, another step in this painting process, which I do pretty much every time, is that it is very rare that in this initial application of color that I get exactly what I'm looking for. Usually I'll put down sort of like an initial layer of color and different colors going on, kind of get the layers built up, but then allowing that to dry, like giving it like an hour or two and then coming back to it, sometimes having fresh eyes on it super helpful, which we know from things like photo editing and food photography. But then two, the colors of the paint do look slightly different once they've dried. Wet versus dry is gonna look different and you can kind of get more of a true sense of what the surface looks like. And then where are the areas that we can add more dynamic color? Where can we kind of mix colors a little bit more? What are some spots and areas of opportunity? So it may take several revisits of the surface of building up layers, kind of several different sessions until you really get to the place where you're like, ah, 
this is what I was going for. And so then the final step in the process, once all of the paint is dry, and admittedly though, I have been skipping this step. I have not, probably I'd say the last 10 boards I've created, I have not done this step. So I would say this is optional. Although if somebody is a professional board maker, they would say this is not optional. It's completely up to you. But most folks often like to then seal the board, kind of seal everything, fix it in place. I admittedly am like, eh ceiling, whatever, it's fine. I just really love like the quality of the surface as it is. I don't want to put anything else on top of it. And if I accidentally spill food on the surface or, you know, mess something up or ding it, like I have the paint, I can just touch it up later. But absolutely, if you want to seal your board, more power to you. There are matte sprays out there that you can just run over. I think that's usually the easiest. There are paint on ones, but I find the spray ones are just easier to work and you get a nice sort of even layer that's not visible. You don't end up with like paintbrush streaks or any additional texture just using that matte fixing spray. Now, one important footnote, I have not personally run into this and I think maybe it has something to do with the climate that I live in, that I am here in the desert in Arizona Arizona, we do not know the definition of humidity. And so this has not been a struggle for me, but something that I have heard other folks have issues with is sometimes the boards are warping. And I think that has to do with humidity and climate and maybe also the materials that you're using. And so a recommendation in those situations that I've heard from lots of folks out there that seems to be a great remedy if you're having problems with your boards bowing or you know, kind of becoming uneven is that before jumping into any of this process, coming in with a joint compound and doing a big X from one corner to the bottom corner and from the other corner to the other corner. So a big X on one side and a big X on the other side, sort of like reinforcing sort of that warpage, the addition of the kind of moisture that's in the joint compound, affixing that to both sides of the board equally at the same time and allowing that to dry. Now you would of course want the board to be in a position where it was upright and you could do that. But ultimately lots of folks have said that, that is the best way to combat that sort of bowed effect and for everything to stay nice and flat. But then once those big X's have dried, then you just go about the process as normal, adding joint compound to the board, adding the paint, doing the other side. I really love the reversible effect fact, you get a two for one situation with every board. But then once that bad boy dries and you are ready for prime time, then it is so much fun to see your artwork, your handiwork. I mean, I know they're boards, but I also kind of see them as art in and of themselves. Some of these I end up wanting to like hang it on a wall, <laughs> but it is so much fun to see how much personality and uniqueness and how very special that makes your food photos. Now, if you have made DIY backdrops before and you have some tips that I did not share in this video, I'm I'm sure you've got some. Feel free to share those down in the comments below. We'd love to learn from you as well. Thanks as always for hanging out with me. It's always a treat. But with that, you stay out of trouble and I'll see you real soon, okay? Bye.